Discussion session of Persepolis, uh, my James of Trappi's graphic memoir. Um, I'm Rachel Truesdell, I'm in the English department here, and this is part of a graphics novel, graphic novels uh, discussion seminar that we've been running all semester. Would you guys mind introducing yourselves? Yeah, I'm Sarah, a senior English creative writing major. I'm Stacy Mantooth, and I'm a senior creative writing classical languages double major. I'm Brianna Kelly. I'm also a senior and I'm also a creative writing major. And what we're going to do today is pretty much a, an informal seminar style discussion of Persepolis, um, which we have in multiple editions here. I've got how it came out in two hardback editions in the States, and we've also got the edition that's being distributed to all the incoming students. So, um, what do you guys want to talk about? about the war. What about it? <laughs> um, how it completely controls her life. Like, not, maybe not controls, controls is a strong word. Maybe like, um, guides her and shapes her. Um, like there was one point where, I mean, they showed it on the television how it was just like taking over all of Iran. And, see, um, war and martyrdom as well, and how she like completely idolized her uncle Anish. Um, what else? I think we need to talk about kind of representational illustrations. What about it? There's so many times where instead of giving us something real, she gives us something very abstract. Like you don't get of course, since she does kind of a looser, more cartoony style, you don't ever really get any real faces. They're all kind of circles with dashes, almost. Mm. And I think that's an interesting pair of questions to be asking, because this one is, is very much about what literal truth and biography, right? If you're talking about the war and how the war has shaped her and how the war has shaped the country, that's very much about this representation of things that are real, right? This is her actual life. This is a, a real person with a real family. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about this representational illustration where what we're getting is this question of how is that truth, this real set of facts, being portrayed in sort of strangely, well, maybe not strangely, but in interestingly abstract terms. Why, I think this is one of my big questions, why is she using the graphic form for this memoir? I mean, it's a, it's a memoir about very serious questions. What does she get out of making it a graphic memoir? Which is, of course, the question you ask about anything. But it, in this case, I think it's particularly interesting what she's doing with it. So I think do you have I think we should also talk about her struggle to kind of find herself as a woman in her religion, as well as in her political uh, climate that she finds her country in. That seems to be something that she struggles with throughout the book. Yeah, and when you say in her religion, which of the religions in the book do you mean? Um, probably the fundamentalist Islam. Okay, but, but it's interesting, right? That seems right? to be the one she yeah. really develops the struggle with to begin with. Mm -hmm. Like before, when she was a little girl, she was embracing religion wholeheartedly, wanting to become a prophet herself. And um, after the Iraqis invade, um, suddenly she's having this forced upon her. It's no longer a choice for her. And she struggles with that as any human being I think, would in this sort of situation. And I think that's really interesting, right? Because we're getting, I mean, as Americans, right, one of the things we hear a lot about is fundamentalist Islam, and, and this uh, particular book has, a, of course, a very sort of startling and scary picture of what that means. And at the same time, we're getting her childhood religion, which she's sort of remembering as these conversations with God with this big fluffy white beard, and then she discovers he looks like Karl Marx. 
Um, and, and, and that sort of contrast, I think, is potentially quite interesting because it's not a book that's rejecting religion as a category. It's a book which is sort of having, it's, it starts out with this sort of friendly, fluffy picture of religion where she's going to be the next prophet. But it ends up with her struggling to find her place in this religion and how she can maintain who she is as a person while also being true to what she was raised to believe. Absolutely. And I think, again, that question of the representational illustration comes in very, very interestingly in how that goes. Yeah. And I do really want to talk about her relationship with God in the very first, whenever uh, he finally leaves her alone after a little while, you know, how she's like, oh, I'm going to be a prophet, you know, and then she says, I want to basically be a revolutionary. And how even though she does kind of deny him, she still relies on him or like on God uh, because he appears again later on to help her out with her back and to help her out with, I don't know, just um, different things like... Hmm. I don't know. Anyway, he appears infrequently, yeah. but consistently. He's a regular, yeah. appearing, recognizable character with a distinctive face, right. which sets him apart from a lot of the other characters who right. are drawn very interchangeably. Exactly. Um, hmm. I think that idea of being a revolutionary is also important here, because she goes through such a series of different phases of what it means to be a revolutionary, which includes the anarchist phase, the punk phase, the dealer phase, right, and all of these are different sort of revolutionary undertakings, or at least rebellious undertakings. And then in the context of the Iranian re revolution, how are we to view that? I mean, is that part of this culture that she's grown up in? Is it a culture of revolution, or is it a revolt against the oppressive regime, or both at the same time? Right. Um, and also, uh, can we talk about the title, uh, Persepolis? Because it sounds really familiar. And I want to say it's from Greek, but I don't know. Is it? Yes, no, Well, it's maybe. the ancient name. Do you have an answer? No, it wasn't an ancient city. Yeah. No. Capital of Persia. <laughs> that so makes sense. why call your book Persepolis? Uh, if, if the place that you're leaving is Tehran, why Persepolis? They're functionally very different cities, even if they're in the same location, much as, I don't know, uh, Londinium and London are no longer the same place, right? True. Okay, I think this is plenty to go on. Um, well, maybe we should start. Maybe we should start with that childhood religion because that's something that a lot of the things build on. Um, and I want to look at that picture of God and Karl Marx. Um, but perhaps to get there, we should look first at page eight. Do you have the same pagination? Probably. Hold on. Page eight. Uh, yep. Where God's holding her. She's talking about being a prophet. Um, and, and there's God cradling her. What do you, what do you think of that picture? Uh, it's like the Virgin Mary cradling the baby Jesus. Yeah, it really is. But it's like the reversal of the sex of this right here. I thought he looked like a giant snowy mountain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're, we're high on uh, iconographic inversion and we're low on realism, right? That's true. Okay, why both? Um. Well, one, I kind of think it's her style, but two, I mean, she could have drawn him, you know, with more features than I mean, yeah, that's different to all of us, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's got the big bushy beard in most people's heads, but um, in my head, he's a woman, so, you know. But, um, so I guess it would make sense to not have him have these very distinct features so we can project our own image of God onto him. Okay, that's interesting. But then why do him as a person with features at all? I mean, the well, idea is that... Still her, her mental image of who God is, so she he has to look like something. Okay, so why does she pick this representation? Why, why the, the God with the big bushy beard? Because he's comforting and fatherly. Um. And she doesn't have a grandfather, is that right? Or one of them is dead. So she could be substituting him too. Yeah. Okay. I, I think 
something's really interesting, right? Because it's this version of the patriarchal religion which is comforting and non-threatening, right? I mean, we're getting, later in the book, we get patriarchal religion as a real enemy. Um, but here in the, the beginning, in the setup, it's really nice, you know? But so that's a really interesting idea, right? Is that we're getting this sort of setup of, of, of the divine fatherly figure as this really nice figure who then does repeatedly come back and help her. Um, okay, well, I think almost the, the answer to that niceness comes if you just look at the opening two panels. This is me when I was 10 years old. This was in 1980. And this is a class photo. I'm sitting on the far left, so you don't see me. Um, and then we get this row of her classmates. What, what, what strikes you about that picture? It's like the little nesting dolls, kind of. You know, yeah. Russia. Well, not only that, I mean, they have no distinguishable features, save for their eyes. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. the way their mouth is turned a little bit. Well, the hair is slightly different. Yeah. But they are awfully similar figures. Um, why draw them like that? There are a lot of ways to make human faces different from each other, even if you're covering the area around them with a piece of black. Mm -hmm. well, I guess because of, like in the third panel, she goes to the Islamic Revolution and how they force the veils on everyone. Mm -hmm. So just that sense of uniformity. Um, I guess that would be one big reason. It also kind of illustrates the struggle to maintain your identity yeah. when you're thrust into a situation like that, when people want you to be just like the other person next to you. You know, she becomes indistinguishable, and that really illustrates that idea in that panel. It also shows that there may be some other stories that she isn't going to be telling you in this uh. book. Yeah, that girl there with her eyes closed must have gone on and had some kind of life. Mm -hmm. The one looking down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's the one that strikes me the most. How okay. come? Uh, I don't know. Like, her and the girl on the far left. The one looking off to the side. Yeah. Are the only two that strike me as having any real emotion, I guess. And even the girl to the far left is like, shh, screw you guys. And with her, it's more, you can feel kind of a burden just through her. There's a sadness that you kind of get from the one who's looking down mm -hmm. Yeah, something has happened in her life. Yeah. And I mean, she's really young, and you don't really think about 10-year-olds having a burden, but they do. The one on the far right is kind of interesting, too. It makes you... I could be reading far too into this, but um, she kind of feels like an optimist. I mean, you know, she's looking directly at the camera. She's attempting to smile. Awkward optimist. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's usual. I think that's interesting, um, and I think it's interesting also in the context of some of the other graphic novels we've read this semester, which have included inset photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and this is saying this is a class photo. Um, we don't have absolute proof that this is a copy of a real class photo, the way we sometimes get in, in the second book of Mouse, for example, we get a, an inset photograph of Art Spiegelman's father. Um, here, this isn't that direct, and or in Fun Home, we get what's clearly copies of real photographs. This isn't doing that. Why describe it as a class photo? And option one, because it is, in fact, copying a real class photo, but then why not copy the class photo in a more photorealistic style. Because this is probably the way she remembers her classmates. You know, I think maybe she was just trying to capture her memories and their personalities in this panel more so than capturing the reality of their class photo. Okay. Well, so what does that mean? Um, what would it mean for her to be remembering these people who clearly have distinct personalities and yet are hard to tell apart? And that's a sort of interesting uh, claim about her memory, right? Well, is she trying to tell their stories a little bit in this time? Oh. That's interesting. Why? Well, just by making them each so different from one another, 
other yet so much alike. You know, their poses are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you if you covered up their faces, you couldn't tell them apart. But just by looking at their faces, we've just been talking about, you know, the emotions they were feeling at this moment, you know, the burdens that they feel, the false optimism they might create for themselves. You know, she's telling their stories mm -hmm. in this panel because maybe because she doesn't have time to tell them in this memoir, but she wants to acknowledge them. That's really interesting, and I think it's especially interesting in the context of this very personal memoir, right? I mean, it's very much about her. It's about, I had my Michael Jackson pin. I cried at the right moment and thus didn't get arrested. And so that's that's very individual, one specific story. But you're arguing that the inclusion of this photo at the beginning is suggesting the multiplicity of these other stories going on in parallel with hers. Well, that's the thing I've noticed with a lot of the memoir style stories we've read. You know, it's been very one-sided from the stories we've been told, especially with Mouse. You know, we got the story from the perspective of the father and the son, and that was it. We didn't get the perspective of the mother or the father's new wife. Mm -hmm. And with this, you know, we're only getting the perspective of the daughter of um, the writer, and we're not getting her, the perspective of what her parents went through or what these girls went through. So I think this is kind of her way of setting up that, yes, there were other things going on, but this is my story, and it's just about me. I think that's really interesting, and I think we've got it. one of the things that's, that this is using the graphic form to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, uh, in, in text that is pure words, you can do that same idea of there are multiple subjectivities out there. Um, I mean, it, it, there, there, I don't think that graphic novels have a monopoly on this idea, but certainly the way that this is, this book is setting up this idea of there being multiple subjectivities out there, but we're concentrating on one for the duration of this book, is absolutely using this graphic form to kind of emphasize both the centrality of the main character and the existence of these other characters around her. Neat. That we starts all that out of just one panel. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> this is called a close reading. <laughs> Um, I don't know, just, even though we do still mainly get her story, um, like on page 253 when she just got back from Vienna, um, she asked her dad what happened in Tehran and Iran whenever, like, during the four years that she was gone. And so he tells her all about that, and in a way, you don't get his story, but you get the story of Iran. So, and I kind of think that it overshadows the entire memoir itself, just because without this you wouldn't have her very strong personality, her rebellious side that always comes out, and it's an essential story to this, like yeah. to hers, you can't have her without the war, so. Yeah, um, and that's really important. It's, um, I think one of the questions this book is asking is how much can you separate a person from the history that she's surrounded by? Right. Um, and I think that Satrapi herself keeps bumping up against this because she wants to think about right. her own individualism. Yeah. She really wants to think of herself as potentially independent. Right. But of course, she can't be. How could she be? Right. How can any of us be? Yeah, it's right. just, I mean, the circumstances that are shaping us vary, and some are more obtrusive than others. Well, other people. Without, you know, I don't know, things happening to you, do you really exist? <laughs> I don't mean to that jump into philosophy, question. but <laughs> seriously. Um, well, I think oh, that leads us uh, maybe into this question of finding oneself as a woman in, under the uh, fundamentalist regime. And one place that I think that's really interesting is on page 74, 75. We get her, her poor mother has been assaulted essentially and mm -hmm. is deeply traumatized. Um, and then we get on the top of 75, in no time the way people dressed became an ideological sign. There were two kinds of women, the fundamentalist woman and then we get the the black triangle with a face on top, and the modern woman, you showed your opposition to the regime by letting a 
few strands of hair show. Um, and then we get the, the parallel two sorts of men. What do you think about that? What are we meant to think of those panels? It's just about as black and white as the entire book. Yeah. Like, I mean, really. That's another thing I wanted to talk about, was why she didn't use grayscale. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's those two extremes. Even though she herself is full of grays, like, like, you can see it in the dialogue and in her narrative, but the images are just black and white. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, the book is full of moral ambiguities. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, well, so narrowing back in on this picture, then, are we how how are we being asked to treat this as a black and white dichotomy? One is right and one is wrong. Well, but that's uh, I mean I mean and right and wrong. Both options like, are pretty much black. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, there's not really just much looking at it from a between. visual standpoint. You know, they're coated in black, and like Stacy said, there's not much of a difference between them, maybe a few strands of hair are showing, or you have just a mustache instead of a full beard. But, you know, other than that, they're pretty much the same. But, but I can see huge differences. For example, fundamentalist woman, no hands. Modern woman, hands. You're still right. Tell me why I'm wrong. Well, um, that's kind of talking about sexism a little bit in this panel, too. What do you mean? Well, both men, all their parts are showing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see both both of them. You can see their hands. You can see their necks. Both their legs are distinguished. Or like a fundamentalist woman, she's a face. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting the sense of there being a distinct difference between the fundamentalist woman and the modern woman, but we're still getting people absolutely categorized by gender, in which the men come out decidedly more as discernible human beings. Okay, well that's interesting, and it's especially interesting that she then goes on in the very next panel after these two panels which have provoked us into a discussion of sexism to say, but let's be fair, if women faced prison when they refused to wear the veil, it was also forbidden for men to wear neckties, that dreaded symbol of the West. And if women's hair got men excited, the same could be said of men's bare arms, and so wearing short-sleeved shirts was also forbidden. Yeah, but then she goes on, whenever she's in university, um, Go for it. She says, let me find it really quickly. Um, oh, that's right here. Um, on page 297. And let's see, can I just read that page? Sure. Okay. So the speaker says, does anyone have any questions? If not, this meeting is over. And Satrapi says, sir, I have a question. You say that our headscarves are short, that our pants are indecent, that we make ourselves up, etc. But as a student of art, a good portion of my time is spent in the studio. I need to, be, I need to be able to spend, the, I need to be able to move more freely to be able to draw. A longer headscarf will make the task even more difficult. As for trousers, you criticize them for being too wide, even though they effectively hide our shape. Knowing that these trousers are in vogue right now, I ask the question: Is religion defending our physical integrity, or is it just opposed to fashion? You don't hesitate to comment on us, but our brothers present here have all shapes and sizes and hair of haircuts and clothes. Sometimes they wear clothes so tight that we can see everything. Why is it that I, as a woman, am expected to feel nothing when watching these men with their clothes sculpted on, but they, as men, can get excited by two inches less of my headscarf? And then she goes on, whenever she's being stopped in the bus, um, like, I don't know, what, Page, was it? She's running to the bus and these two guards stop her, or these two policemen stop her, and they're like, you can't run because your butt shakes, and she was like, well, don't stare at my ass. And so, I mean, just taking that into consideration and then flipping back over here, I... Okay, so you're saying, she's saying, well, to be fair, and the, you don't buy the claim of fairness. Exactly. That's uh -huh. not fair at all. Okay. And. So she's, she's doing a kind of interesting rhetorical move here where she's pretending that she's being fair to the regime right. by pretending that the regime is being fair to women. Right. Like she's taking the pro stance and then slaps it down. So. Okay. That's interesting. Um, 
So this question of finding a place for oneself as a woman in Iran, which is, I think, very different from this question of finding a place for oneself as a woman in religion or even in Islam, um, very, very different, um, is related then kind of interestingly to this question of tricky rhetorical moves so that it becomes not just about, well, what can you get away with, but about how do you work their rhetoric to use it back on them. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's full of holes. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> That's fun. All right. How are we doing? Um, I think that kind of leads us to the war, actually. And I think that it leads us to the war partly because we can talk about this, this rhetoric of martyrdom that's being used in the schools where she's being asked to, to beat her chest, mm -hmm. um, but also to look at what Satrapi's rhetoric is here, what Satrapi is using to manipulate our reactions to the war, because there are a lot of possible reactions we could have. Um, so which reactions is she going for with this combination of artwork and words that she's giving us? Um, does anyone have panels they want to suggest, or? We can go from the one on 95. It's a good one. Um, I think more the images speak here than do the words. Okay, this is the one with them all yeah, beating, beating their, their chest, breasts. In yeah, person. right, and I mean, you see this, they're all blank, or, you know, they, they don't understand. You can see that they don't understand why they're doing yeah. this, um, just because it's been forced on them. And then there are others. Um, well, let's let's look at this one a little longer. Um, we were talking about those undifferentiated faces of the schoolgirls on the first page. Right. Um, compare that with this panel. Well, at least on the first page, they have emotion. Like this, you just get confusion. Yeah. So. How different are these faces from each other? I mean, well, they're slightly different eyes, and they have different hair peeking yeah. out too. Okay, so we can imagine a circumstance in which this panel could be altered to make these people look different from each other. Yeah. However, as they currently stand, it's like one of those things at the back of highlights for kids where you're supposed to find the differences between the two pictures. Um, well, she's got curly hair and hers is straight, yeah. um, but the facial expressions are identical. Okay, why do that? Why have them be more identical than usual in this particular panel? Because in this panel, they were all being forced to act exactly the same, no matter what. Um, so they're all being treated the same. So they're all seen in the eyes of the government as exactly the same. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I really want to talk about Foucault, but I suppose that's unfair. <laughs> Um, this idea of everybody being forced to go through the same actions, making everybody essentially become more alike by those actions that they're sharing. That, that they're sharing. There, I got my Foucault on. Okay, that's that's scary. Um, well, but that's not exactly the war, right? That's mm -hmm. that's mourning over the war. So where do we get some pages illustrating the war? Recruiting little boys. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, page 102. Let's definitely. look at that combination. We've got 101 where they're recruiting little boys, and the little boys are doing the same yeah. chest beating thing. Um, and it looks like a comic strip, right? We've got the, the panels with gutters between them, we've got people talking, we have a little flash sideways where somebody's describing what's happening. Um, but it's a it's a fairly linear narrative and it's a recognizable visual form. Um, then you turn the page, and why do the picture like that? You said she doesn't use grayscale, and she doesn't. And this is one of the few places where we've got anything at all scratchy in the visual. Why why have the scratchy visuals? Um, one, it's to show the explosion. It's, I mean, they're in minefields. Guys. And I guess I don't know, to show the. Well, it's also very abstract because she doesn't know what this looks like and she 
doesn't know any of these people, so none of them have faces. Mm -hmm. We also get all those silhouettes of the keys that they've been given. Mm -hmm. Why why that visual emphasis on the keys? Irony, what do you mean? Uh, they're given keys because, uh, what, the key to heaven? Mm -hmm. paradise. Yeah, yeah, paradise. Yeah. Right. And, I mean, it didn't really help them out a lot. They, the keys stay with them when they die. So they don't get to take them to paradise. I mean, and they're just like cheap plastic pieces of crap, but... Okay. She's also putting it on a very white background, so I guess you can throw in that idea of going to paradise as being similar to being exploded. That's grim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Speaking of grim, we've got the top mm, two-thirds of the page is this picture of these poor young boys being blown up. And then we've got the bottom third of the page, and what's that a picture of? A party. For whom? For a little boy. Yeah. And her mom has knitted her a sweater full of holes, and Margie's been able to go with a necklace made of chains and nails because punk rock was in. Why juxtapose these panels? Because she didn't understand. She didn't know what was happening there. She was here. This is her life. This is completely, I mean, while they're on the same page, they're still very separate things, like... Yeah. Are there visual overlaps? Yeah. yeah, the... Especially these two. Dancing kids look a lot like the exploding people. These two right here look almost identical. That's so. exactly that same silhouette with the foot backwards and mm -hmm. the arms up. Yeah. Why have that parallel when they're so different? Well, they're still children. Mm -hmm. It's just that contrast to see how quickly childhood can be taken away. Okay, so that the the party image is emphasizing the ch the childness of these soldiers. Well, it makes them together. Oh, the soldiers are emphasizing the danger that the kids on the lower panel are in. Well, yeah, I mean, they could have their childhood wiped away at any mm -hmm. minute, and these kids are just embracing life, dancing, and having mm -hmm. fun while they can they don't know when, you know, that'll change for them. Yeah, this is it's also um, a different type of conformity. What do you mean? Well, all the kids in the lower panel dressed alike to be punk rock, and they're all kind of dancing around, acting the same. Are you suggesting that punk is a uniform? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> I'm also not suggesting that Kurt Cobain is. Long dead. Um, <laughs> Okay, but that's interesting too, right? Why why punk? I mean, it's if it's 1980 some, there are a lot of possible different trends to follow, and of course, presumably, she really did go to a punk party. But still, why emphasize that particular aspect? Like, yeah. It's all about rebellion, except their rebellion is making them act more like other people, but further away from this opposite extreme that happens to look very similar on this page. Yeah. But it's fake damage. She's knitted, her mother has knitted her a sweater full of holes. Those holes are there on purpose. She has a necklace of nails. That sounds painful. We're getting this, this, this safe version of the horrible danger that these kids are being sent into in the panel above. So that the boy soldiers and Margie and her friends are having the same experiences and yet absolutely not. Uh, it's, it's almost as though the, the, the party panel is both uh, a parody of the war and the war is a parody of the party. And it, like, just the two juxtaposed together, it makes it a lot more poignant. Like, you go from exploding boys to explosive fun, you know, I mean, it's... If only there are fireworks. I know. <laughs> Sparkle! <laughs> Horrifying. <laughs> okay. All right, what else have we got on the board? Um, maybe looking at what's on TV. You brought up the TV question. Um, seems important because there's this problem of reliable information in this book, right? Um, where do you turn for reliable information if you're Margie's father? BBC. The BBC, the repository of all truth. <laughs> um, well, so, what are we to make of that? I have it somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's important to ask in part because this is a memoir and it's full of truth claims. Mm -hmm. So we're getting this idea of truth as something that gets questioned and checked up on. And of course, we can't check up on Satrapi. I mean, we could ask her, but there's no reason she would have to change her story just because we ask her. If you're looking for it's 84, where oh. he's looking at. I stopped one page too soon and flipping through. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so yeah, we get this moment where um, Raji and her father are dancing around the house because they've just successfully bombed Baghdad. And, um, and it's been verified by the BBC, which makes it true. Right. Well, so that's the sort of moment of, of haha, dad's skepticism was wrong, which is then instantly punctured by the revelation that the reason that the anthem was played was that the pilots demanded. Um, why are we getting this sort of equivocal take on dad's skepticism? He's right to be a skeptic, and yet these things he says don't happen, really do happen. Well, his skepticism is more of a defense because he doesn't want to be disappointed. Like, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, this time, the two news stations coincided, but there were other times when they were like, yeah, we shot down eight bombers when really they shot down 14 of the Iranians. So, I mean, his skepticism protects his family, so I guess, or yeah. maybe not his family, but at least him. Or you say really when actually <laughs> we, we don't know exactly who's telling the truth either yeah, that's whether true. it's the BBC or that's true. their own government so okay that I think that that brings up a big I mean we're back to the existential problem right of can can this concept of truth just get damaged and at some point we get uh, somebody doing a mathematical computation of how many tanks they've claimed to have destroyed over the course of the war and it's something like claiming, oh, we've destroyed 3,000 tanks. And it's just not physically possible that, that there were that many tanks there to destroy to begin with. Um, so that this, this notion of verifiable truth gets almost itself cast into doubt. Um, you know they're lying to you, but does that mean that there's a truth that's out there that you can find, or does it mean that there's just nothing there findable? I mean, obviously I'd say that verifiably in the real world you can probably whether or not we can find out the evidence, there's probably a real number of tanks that were destroyed. Yeah. Um, but this book seems to be operating on that as a, an unknowable quantity. Okay, I think that brings me back to the question of why do this in graphic form? How does the graphic memoir make its kind of truth claims? What kind of truth claims can a graphic memoir make that, that are sort of unique to the form? It can help you put yourself into the story more. Um, How do you mean? Well, personally, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about you know the war between Iran and Iraq. Um, I don't really educate myself on war, so I should. I know, shame on me. Boo. But this was really, it helped me get a feel for the fundamentalists and the modernists and how they fought, like they had their own little civil war, and how Iraq tried to take over Iran again, and it just, it really, for me, the uneducated brought it home. I guess, a lot more than, say, a, a, just a regular novel would, because if this was just in regular novel form, I would go to sleep. I mean, I'm, I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> just because it was so informative, like, there's just a mountain of information in this book. Okay, so. how do the pictures change how the information is conveyed? It's not just, oh, look, there's right. something pretty to distract me while I learn things. Well, it's not it, really It becomes less painful if I can look at something nice. Right. 
one for this memoir, she can only show what she knows about, and in a way she knows about it. So when she talks about all these people being martyrs, she can actually show you martyrs without actually knowing what they look like, or having to actually tell you there are this many martyrs and they were these people. So it's a way for her to convey information in a, in a more personal way, I guess. Okay, so it's, it's less statistic-like and more here's, here's a real person who really died. Well, I mean, I suppose as an English professor, I should really be saying, no, no, words alone can get that through. But I, I do think that there's something about the pictures which makes it very specifically individual, which is also interesting because we were saying, oh, these individuals are all deliberately drawn to kind of look like each other. So that we're simultaneously having this, this unity and this very specific individual set of particular experiences. I was flipping back and through like various mm -hmm. scenes that kind of grabbed me at first, and um, one in particular that really uh, stayed with me was when the mother is coming in to talk about her son and how uh, he got that key, of par key to paradise mm -hmm. early on. It's on page 100, and how um, as uh, her Satrapi's mother is trying to talk to him and tell him that you know this is a lie you've been told and he's ignoring it, he's eating like the food that she offered him, and then just out of nowhere he just says, I'll marry your daughter! And, you know, just the reaction among all three of the women in the scene kind of stayed with me, you know, the mother's, his mother is of course offended, and then the other mother is trying not to make a big deal out of it, but the daughter, Satrapi, is easily freaked. You know, she's probably never even thought about marriage up until this point. And certainly like. not to somebody who can just say, oh, I'll, I'll have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think that's a really good example of how this is managing to get um, real depths of cultural conflict, cultural meaning, uh, different layers of a social stratus, sorry, social strata in there um, simultaneously and in very quick, efficient form. And that look on his face, he's got this cute little smile, I'll marry her. When I'm graduating, he doesn't even from, realize what he's saying. Yeah, he you know, has, no, he has idea. no idea what the implications are yeah. of what he's saying. You know, he's still a kid. But we're able to figure out from that very quick moment what kind of information he's been getting that makes him think that that's something he can say. Right? I mean, this he's been being given all this propaganda about what'll happen if he's a martyr, what'll happen, what what benefits he'll get, what what essentially he's being bribed with. Um, and part of it is this idea that he gets to just say, oh, well, I'll marry her over there. Um, okay, that's, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's part of the case for the graphic memoir as a genre in itself. Um, because it, it, there's this efficiency of communication going on there. Like if you had tried to write this scene out in prose form, you know, it probably would have taken a while to describe how his mother reacted, how her mother reacted, and then just go into very deep descriptions of what she was feeling at this moment. And in just two short panels, you know, she got the point across with just two little looks. Yeah. And I think you could, in principle, do it very efficiently in language, but it, it would have to be aimed at a very sophisticated reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty good. Do you have anything you want to add? I think what we've done here is we've sort of made a case for how this uh, not fully realistic representation, although we haven't really done justice to some of the really crazy, cool artistic panels um, which are in there. You like the party ones? Um, but we're running low on time, I think, so we'd better leave that for future exploration. Um, but I think that we've, what we've done here is talk a little bit about how this works as a whole as both uh, a personal memoir and a personal memoir with larger argument and critique in it of an entire uh, historical period and movement, um, which is also, of course, a very particular perspective, which she is really, really intensely arguing for. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for hanging out and discussing this, and this was a lot of fun.